You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech Podcast. I have Alexei Otapov. Uh, he works with Singularity Net as an AI researcher, and we're going to be talking about their experiments with generative capsule networks. So I know about uh, a little bit about generative adversarial networks, but not about uh, generative capsule networks. So, Alexei, welcome. How are you doing? Uh, hello, Richard. Uh, I'm fine. How are you? And you? Good, good. So what are... Um, Generative capsule networks. What does that mean? Uh, well, uh, actually, this was a short experiment uh, uh, two years ago, so maybe it's not uh, the very best uh, uh, topic uh, to discuss. Uh, but uh, in any case, okay. uh, uh, we uh, our main uh, uh, one of our main goals uh, was to. Uh, investigate the limitations of uh, deep learning networks and uh, we studied uh, different uh, ways uh, uh, how to extend uh, their capabilities and uh, uh, we encountered a a paper on uh, capsule networks uh, by uh, Hinton and uh, his colleagues Uh, and uh, well basically uh, this uh, uh, capsule networks, uh, they, uh, uh, how it, uh, to put uh, in words, it's uh, much uh, more easy to uh, draw on a board. Uh, okay, so imagine uh, you have a, a handwritten digit, like in a MNIST data set, and uh, uh, you have a network which you try uh, to train uh, uh, to recognize uh, different uh, digits. And uh, uh, if uh, you have uh, the same digit uh, rotated uh, to different angles, uh, traditional uh, uh, architectures, uh, traditional f- models of formal neurons, uh, uh, they will need uh, to uh, actually learn uh, to recognize this digit uh, in all possible uh, uh, rotations. So. Uh, they will uh, do it uh, not uh, very efficiently uh, and uh, uh, they will not be able to extrapolate uh, to different uh, rotation angles uh, uh, just uh, just to interpolate between them. And uh, in general, you will not have uh, a neuron except uh, a very... uh, high-level neurons uh, which will correspond uh, to this digit and uh, its uh, parts. So, for example, if we have uh, six or nine, it has, uh, uh, they, they have a circle, uh, they have some specific strokes, and uh, these neural networks, uh, traditional neural networks, uh, they will fail uh, uh, to decompose uh, uh, these uh, images of uh, digits uh, into the components. All right, quick question here. Quick question. Yeah, okay. Would you need a separate neural network for each digit? Uh, or could you have one that would identify all 10 of them? Uh, no, you don't really need uh, a separate network to uh, every digit because uh, you can train a network, uh, uh, a large, uh, only one but larger network to uh, incorporate uh, all different uh, uh, digits in all different forms and uh, uh, this network uh, uh, will somehow manage uh, uh, to learn shared uh, representation, some shared information uh, between uh, different digits so it's not that bad. 
you will be able to use one network uh, to recognize them all. Uh, but uh, what I mean is that uh, uh, for every rotation angle, uh, it will learn uh, a sort of uh, its own decomposition. Uh, uh, it, uh, it's, uh, say, uh, convolutional neural network, uh, and uh, each uh, uh, convolutional map will correspond uh, uh, to a very specific stroke. Uh, so it uh, will correspond uh, uh, to the same stroke uh, in uh, only one orientation and another feature map will correspond uh, maybe to the same stroke in another orientation. Uh, so it uh, will fail uh, to capture this uh, regularities uh, to incorporate it, uh, them uh, into its representation of uh, these images. Uh, and uh, capsule networks, uh, CAPSNETs, uh, they are trying uh, to overcome this uh, limitation. Uh, they uh, don't just uh, pass uh, activation levels, uh, they also uh, try to uh, figure out uh, uh, transformations of uh, these uh, uh, paths, uh, receptive uh, fields of uh, each uh, uh, neural network, uh, uh, of each neuron or uh, con convolution map uh, will be augmented with uh, uh, these uh, uh, parameters of uh, the transformation. And uh, uh, the hope was uh, for these uh, CAPSNETs uh, that uh, they will really uh, learn uh, uh, how to represent a specific object and uh, its uh, subparts. Uh, it actually doesn't uh, work uh, that well, but uh, it uh, has uh, uh, some uh, sense uh, behind uh, the idea. Well, okay, wait, wait, one second. If the caps nets are old, what is the latest and greatest you know, in this area? What are the new AIs called and how do they work? Well, uh, CAPSNETs uh, are not that old, uh, and uh, uh, they uh, have, uh, uh, they still have uh, some uh, uh, potential uh, to be discovered uh, because uh, there are some uh, quite novel works uh, with the use of uh, CAPSNETs. And uh, but yeah, CAPSNETs uh, were very popular uh, two years ago, and uh, people, uh, well, uh, some. Uh, uh, utility of uh, them uh, was found, but um, uh, uh, may maybe they are missing something. So uh, our idea was uh, uh, to create a generative uh, capsule networks because uh, the basic uh, model of uh, caps nets uh, is uh, discriminative. So they take images as input and uh, uh, produce uh, their representations uh, or results of recognition and so on. And uh, in our experiments, uh, we found out that uh, generative models, uh, they also have the uh, same limitations. So it's uh, very difficult for them to learn invariants and uh, to extrapolate uh, beyond the uh, domain of uh, the training set. But yeah, okay. our, our experiments, uh, uh, we're also of a uh, limited success, so we gained some improvements, uh, but uh, not uh, as large uh, as we hoped. Uh, actually, if uh, you ask me about uh, uh, the modern models, uh, you, uh, you may know that uh, in, uh, uh, in natural language processing, such uh, models as BERT, uh, GDP, and so on, they are quite popular right now. And uh, they, are, uh, you, they are based on uh, uh, attention uh, mechanisms, uh, especially self-attention. And in fact, uh, uh, both uh, CAPS nets and uh, uh, atten self-attention uh, based models, uh, they share some uh, common properties. So uh, they uh, go uh, beyond traditional uh, neural networks uh, uh, by introducing a sort of addressing. So it's a way uh, how uh, neurons uh, can uh, pass not only values, but addresses. Uh, what does that mean, addresses? What's an example of that? Well, <laughs> uh, if uh, we are talking about uh, just uh, 
uh, programming languages, uh, uh, you can have a variable and uh, uh, you can use this variable as a reference uh, to the value which is uh, stored uh, uh, in uh, some memory cell. And okay. uh, is, this is uh, uh, what uh, uh, neural networks are not very suited, uh, well suited for. And actually, uh, there was a seminal paper uh, by Fodor and uh, Polishin, uh, which, uh, well, it was something like uh, 1986 or 8, I don't remember exactly. Uh, they criticized uh, uh, connectionist uh, models like uh, neural networks uh, uh, for their inability uh, to solve uh, the variable binding problem. So, uh, you, uh, your neuron uh, has a very fixed uh, position and uh, it reacts on a very fixed uh, uh, stimuli. And uh, if we consider uh, symbolic systems, uh, it's uh, uh, much more easier uh, with uh, symbolic systems. Actually, they uh, can process such things naturally. Uh, you, you, you can just... Uh, uh, denote uh, something by something and uh, uh, use this uh, uh, variable uh, for in different places and uh, uh, you will refer to the same thing in different places uh, with the use of this variable and uh, you can bind a value to this variable. This is uh, uh, what is called a variable binding problem and uh, it leads uh, to a very compositional uh, uh, stuff uh, which is uh, very important for reasoning uh, and so on. And uh, uh, this is what uh, neural networks are lacking and uh, uh, different models, uh, uh, both self-attention models, uh, which uh, uh, give us uh, a lot of uh, cool modern uh, stuff in uh, natural language processing and uh, computer vision also, and uh, such models as uh, CAPSNETs and uh, uh, other exotic models like HyperNets, uh, which we also uh, studied uh, some time ago, uh, they actually try to overcome this problem with uh, uh, variable binding. Uh, again, if... Uh, so what, uh, what are some of the modern problems that, you know, you're looking to tackle? What, you know, just determining, oh, okay, this handwritten letter is the number nine seems elementary. Like, what are the problems right now that you're looking to solve? Well, uh, uh, if uh, we go beyond uh, basic models uh, uh, like uh, CAPSNETs and so on, I mean basic in uh, terms that they are building blocks of larger models, uh, then uh, uh, we can uh, go to uh, some uh, difficult uh, problems uh, which uh, require this sort of stuff. Uh, for example, visual question answering uh, is uh, such a kind of problem. So uh, you have an image and uh, you can ask uh, uh, nearly arbitrary questions uh, about this image, like uh, uh, what is left uh, to the uh, tall building uh, uh, near a bus stop or something like this. And uh, questions uh, can, be, uh, uh, can have a really compositional nature. So you compose uh, different uh, uh, components uh, uh, together and uh, it's uh, very difficult uh, for neural networks uh, to process uh, such uh, compositional uh, queries uh, to our uh, uh, system. And uh, uh, here uh, you also will uh, face uh, with uh, pro problems uh, like uh, how to address uh, different uh, uh, things uh, uh, for example, for visual reasoning. And the visual question answering uh, is, uh, well, uh, it uh, of course has uh, uh, pr practical uh, applications, uh, uh, but uh, uh, there are um, uh, very practical uh, tasks uh, which also require a sort of uh, visual answering. For example, uh, in the context of uh, smart cities, uh, uh, we uh, have uh, such tasks as uh, anomaly detection in road scenes. And uh, you really should reason about uh, images uh, uh, because uh, there are different objects uh, like uh, pedestrians, cars, uh, 
um, bicycles, uh, uh, traffic signs, and so on, and they interact uh, with, with each other. And uh, uh, you should uh, uh, find the uh, compositional patterns of the interaction, and uh, uh, you should be able to reason about uh, this. And if uh, uh, we are trying to build uh, end-to-end uh, deep neural uh, network, uh, it uh, might be difficult uh, to do this. Uh, that's actually why we switched uh, from uh, pure deep uh, uh, neural networks to uh, uh, neural symbolic uh, systems, uh, which uh, uh, which are becoming quite popular right now. Okay. Do you, do you have to string together multiple AI systems or multiple neural network systems in order to solve problems, or can one? is the attempt to have one network solve a larger problem. You know what I mean? Or do you have to pass along a problem or pass it back and forth between different neural networks in order to solve it? Uh, well, uh, uh, end-to-end systems uh, uh, are very popular because uh, it's uh, very nice uh, to be able uh, to just uh, uh, take a neural network, a single neural network, uh, which... Uh, can be composed of uh, different modules, uh, but in any case, it's a, a single neural network with, which is trained uh, with the use of uh, one uh, same loss function. It, it is uh, trained uh, from end to end, and uh, it's uh, really uh, great if uh, we can do this. Uh, but in practice, uh, uh, such uh, systems uh, uh, can be trained uh, for a, a very particular uh, domain or very particular data set, and uh, uh, they will work uh, not very well outside uh, uh, this uh, particular data set. Uh, that's why, uh, yeah, we, we consider uh, hybrid systems, which uh, can include uh, uh, different uh, components, uh, which uh, can be pre-trained uh, using uh, uh, different uh, data sets, different uh, uh, tasks uh, and uh, uh, these uh, components uh, can be united uh, uh, by uh, some other system. It's uh, what uh, uh, we are doing with the use uh, of cognitive architecture. So if uh, we have a hybrid cognitive architecture, uh, it uh, can uh, have uh, different uh, uh, neural networks as uh, sub-components, for example, for uh, for the vision system, it will be uh, one neural network. For uh, audio system, it will be another network, network and uh, uh, so on. Uh, so if uh, we consider uh, benchmarks, uh, public uh, benchmarks, uh, uh, which uh, uh, do have a very specific data set, then uh, uh, most likely... Uh, state-of-the-art models uh, which uh, uh, win uh, uh, these b- benchmarks uh, which uh, show the best results on them, uh, z- z- they will be a holistic uh, one network which uh, is trained end by end. Uh, and and uh, it uh, can contain different components, for example, a, a convolutional neural network for image processing and uh, uh, a recurrent neural network uh, for uh, for the text input, uh, if we are talking about uh, visual question answering. Uh, but uh, this uh, neural network uh, will specialize a lot. It will uh, uh, learn biases uh, in uh, this data set. And uh, uh, what is good for such benchmarks uh, uh, may be not very good uh, for practical applications. And that's why... Uh, in practice, uh, we really uh, use uh, hybrid systems with uh, multiple components, uh, including uh, different neural networks in particular. So what are the, some of the big problems that uh, that you're working on? What are some of the really tough ones that people want to solve right now with AI? Well, uh, there are a, a lot of them, actually, and uh, uh, it uh, also really depends on uh, what... Uh, uh, what uh, methods uh, do you want to use? Uh, for example, in uh, Singularity Net, uh, some people are working on uh, bioinformatics uh, uh, problems uh, like uh, uh, 
uh, revealing uh, genes and the, their combinations uh, uh, which are associated uh, with uh, uh, longevity. And uh, they, uh, uh, for these purposes, uh, they use a symbolic uh, pattern mining. Uh, and uh, it's a, a quite a general uh, but not uh, too popular tool. Uh, if uh, uh, and it's uh, really an important uh, problem. So, uh, well, uh, there are very huge uh, problems uh, which uh, cannot be solved right now. Like, uh, let's uh, mm, try to solve uh, the longevity problem on a, a biologic uh, biologic uh, system level, and uh, uh, in this case, we will need a real AGI, which can read uh, uh, papers, uh, scientific papers on this stuff and so on. Uh, and But if uh, we are not uh, talking about uh, such uh, large uh, problems uh, which cannot be solved right now, uh, there are still uh, many uh, more local uh, problems uh, in uh, different areas. Uh, as my colleagues, uh, uh, for example, uh, also in Singularity Net, are working on uh, uh, speech processing, and uh, uh, one of uh, the problems uh, is uh, uh, what to do if uh, we have uh, too few examples and these examples are too short. And uh, uh, we, again, we need uh, to improve our uh, uh, deep neural network models or whatever. Uh, so, well, I, I'm not <laughs> sure uh, what uh, problems uh, to indicate. Uh, another uh, problem is uh, personal assistance. Uh, there are many uh, existing personal uh, assistant uh, uh, applications uh, like uh, Siri, uh, I don't uh, remember all of them. Uh, we have uh, Alice uh, in uh, Russia. Uh, oh, yeah. What is Alexa, Siri, etc.? Uh, yeah, yeah right. Alexa, Alice, Siri, uh, and so on. Uh, they are not bad, uh, but um, uh, you can easily uh, fool them, or maybe not fool, but uh, uh, they will uh, not solve uh, your tasks when you ask them uh, something which uh, requires reasoning. Uh, and uh, uh, actually, well, my personal experience with uh, uh, this uh, type of uh, software is that uh, uh, if I consider them as a just a voice interface uh, uh, to a non-intelligent piece of software, uh, I, I become much more comfortable with them because, uh, in fact, they are really stupid. Uh, so uh, it's uh, just a sort of interface uh, to uh, to the existing skills. Uh, and if I know uh, which skills uh, they have, uh, uh, this is like a menu. I can uh, just uh, select uh, uh, one... Uh, uh, a thing from menu or another and uh, uh, well they uh, they cannot uh, really reason and uh, uh, I cannot ask them uh, anything I want uh, and uh, there are many possible uh, ways uh, to improve them uh, using uh, neural symbolic systems once again because uh, symbolic uh, uh, component uh, allows them to reason uh, to uh, it's similar actually to the visual answer uh, uh, to visual question answering but uh, uh, instead of images uh, we can have here a history of our interactions with a personal assistant so we can have a compositional uh, type of question like uh, well please remember that uh, i like uh, uh, this kind of pizza, and uh, my friend uh, don't like this kind of pizza. And uh, please uh, uh, help us to find a restaurant uh, uh, which uh, mm, corresponds uh, to uh, both our uh, uh, preferences. So please select a restaurant uh, with uh, this kind of pizza, but without uh, that kind of pizza. And uh, uh, no personal assistant right now can uh, handle such a request.
and it uh, really requires a sort of uh, compositional reasoning. Okay. So there are there are ma- many uh, m- many tasks uh, of uh, different scale uh, to be solved, uh, still to be solved by artificial intelligence. So my last question is: What what do you think will happen in the next five or maybe even ten years? What do you think AI will be able to accomplish? Oh, well, it's difficult to answer because uh, uh, in uh, 10 years, even uh, technological singularity uh, may take place uh, on the one hand. On another hand, even uh, self-driving cars uh, uh, can uh, still be not reliable enough uh, for uh, uh, total uh, use. Uh, so we may hope that uh, 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 self-driving cars uh, uh, will be dominant and uh, people, uh, humans, will not drive anymore and uh, we will have uh, much less car a- accidents, but uh, I cannot promise that uh, because uh, this problem uh, can appear be much uh, more difficult uh, than uh, we see. Uh, so, well, there is a very wide range of uh, possibilities from no, cell, uh, no total use of self-driving cars and up to technological singularity. But, uh, well, very we, good. Can, very good. Yeah, we, we can guess uh, some uh, stuff like uh, we will have uh, more and more uh, robots uh, in uh, call centers uh, everywhere, uh, and so on, but uh, well, it's uh, very difficult to uh, to guess uh, what will uh, surely happen uh, in this time range and uh, what will surely not happen. <laughs> well, very good. Well, Alexi, thank you for coming on the call. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Richard. Uh, bye. Bye. Okay. Bye. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Thank you.